Good morning. It's good to see you all. If you're visiting with us, we are glad to have you in our assembly. If you have any questions about what we say or do here, what we teach or preach, you would be our friend to ask us. If you agree, let us know. If you, if you disagree, again, let us know. Our whole aim and our hope is to teach what the Bible teaches and to stand by God's Word. If you open your Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews, and we'll be starting the 8th chapter. Hebrews chapter 8, uh, we'll actually start in verse 1. The text says, Now the main point in which has been said is this, We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the, on the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. For every, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also has something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since uh, there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. As from this text, we're going to be drawing the theme of our lesson this morning, that is according to the pattern. Many have uh, claimed or tried to make the critique against the Lord's people that we are just, quote, patternist, uh, because we always look for the pattern that God has given us. But the funny thing is, when that comes up, I'm often left wondering, why is that a bad thing? Why is it a bad thing that we are seeking to follow what God has laid out in his word? And so this morning, I want to consider a few things related to this verse about why we need to order ourselves, our worship, our teaching, our preaching, after the pattern that God has given us. First reason why we need to do this is because, well, our own ideas of worship will always be wrong. If it comes from man's brain, nine times out of ten, it's not in line with what God wants. For example, our ways are not the right ways. Jeremiah, in chapter 10, verse 23, the prophet declares there, he says, I know that a way is not, uh, the way of man is not found within himself. And he prays there for Jehovah to guide his steps. And really how this applies to our lesson is we can, mankind can come up with all sorts of stuff of what he would want to have in worship. Look at any of the world religions, look at, the, look at paganism, look at all of it. Those are all examples of what man has come up to satisfy himself for religion. In fact, one of the earliest critiques against Christianity uh, from the pa Roman pagans was it lacked all the things of true religion, they said. Which, according to the Roman mind, true religion was opium, or getting high, engaging in gross immorality of the flesh. There is a reason why in Roman religion there was something called the temple prostitute, and I'm going to leave it at that. That's man-made religion that appeals to man's senses, especially the male senses, in his untrained and corrupted form. But that's the idea of man's religion. So if it originates from the mind of man, odds are it's probably not going to be according to what God wants. In fact, the confusion in the religious world today is not new. I mean, we see that one, one church has the praise band, one church does not. This group does special services on this day of the week. Um, it reminds me of a story, not a story, an incident I had happen to me. I was holding my first meeting in Sweet Home, Oregon, which is almost dead center in the state. You have to drive 45 minutes off the freeway to even get there. A small little one-room church, and they had gotten a voicemail that day because there was a uh, congregation, there was two congregations in that town, both kind of went by the same name, and they, they was from Eugene town about our south says we have your paintball reservation for your youth group and of course I think I would have been a pretty bad preacher if I didn't bring that into that sermon that night which I did and I'm bringing it in here now some people will do that and slap a worship sticker on it and say we worship God and is that what God wanted 
You know, we touched on some of this stuff last week with the whole topic of fellowship. Some people's idea of fellowship is as long as we, we can get together and do whatever we want, so long as we say a prayer or read a Bible verse, we can slap fellowship on that. And that cheapens the idea of fellowship we talked about. Fellowship, again, is emphasis on that, that common unity in Christ and what that entails and that deep relationship with him. But so many people do, do whatever they want for worship and just expect that God will accept it. That's very entitled, if you ask me. But notice in the book of Malachi, uh, last uh, book right before uh, Matthew in your Bibles, last book of the Old Testament. But Malachi here in chapter 1, starting in verse 6. It's unfortunate to me that when we, when we close the Old Testament, this is the picture we get of the religious state of God's people. Starting in verse 6, it says here, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. And this is God speaking through the prophet to the people. Then, if I'm a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the, blame, the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is that not evil? Why not, offer, would, why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts. A few points here. God's complaint against the people was they were doing whatever was convenient, whatever they wanted, outside of God's pattern. They were offering up lame and sick animals, which was not, which was forbidden in the law. The law specifically required that, especially on the Passover sacrifice, for example, that the lamb that was to be offered was to be spotless and pure. A very prized lamb, very prized livestock. That God wanted the best. He deserves nothing less. And here, here they are. I don't want to give up that one, but that one over there has kind of got a crooked eye and his leg's broken. Yeah, I was going to kill him anyway, but I can give him to the temple. And so God's complaint is, I mean, we, using a modern day example is, would the government take that for your taxes? That's really, really what, he's at, what he's asking here. It's like, okay, you're presenting this to me, Almighty Jehovah, would you actually give that to your governor when it comes time to pay tax? And of course, the rhetorical, it's a rhetorical question. Of course they wouldn't. They would make sure that the government got what was best. But they were just slapping whatever they wanted to, a sticker on whatever they wanted to, and called it worship, and God was done with it. They were going outside of his pattern. And also, uh, we need to bring in Isaiah 55. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And whatever we think may be an improvement upon worship, an improvement upon doctrine, sorry to tell you, it's not. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God through the prophet says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. And, he, and then he compares to how as far as the east is from the west, so are my ways from your ways and my thoughts from your thoughts. We are a limited, finite being stuck in this universe. Just, just try and picture in your mind right now, try and think of what eternity is. You really can't think of it. You really can't picture it. We're linear. We, have a, we see everything in beginning, middle, and end. God's infinite. God exists outside that. God can see what is best and what he desires and how it is very arrogant of us to think that me, little, inferior man, limited man, can tell Almighty God what God wants. Because when we, when we add or take away from God's pattern for worship or for anything, that's what we're telling him. I know you set this up, God, and it's, it's pretty good, but I have a better idea. That's like trying to argue with the instruction manual on your car. I know it says I should put premium gas in this high-quality 
Super Sport Camaro. But regular will do just fine. No. It will not. And that's, that's the thing. We need to recognize that our own ideas about worship, about God, they're going to fall short. I want to go to Exodus now. I want to note some things about God's instructions about the tabernacle. We're not going to read the whole chapter because God goes into some very explicit instructions. How many posts are supposed to be in the tabernacle? How many, how many holes in the curtain to hold up the curtain? What the curtain's supposed to be made of? The color, all of it, especially for the priest. Now, on the tabernacle, that's one example, but for the priest's garments, he specifies the gems and their placements, what they represent. He is very detailed, and he's not detailed to give the children of Israel busy work. He's detailed for a purpose. God reveals something the way he reveals it. It's not by accident. And so when we go to Exodus here in the 25th chapter, we're just going to read two verses here. And, well, one verse in 25 and one verse in 26. And so it says here in verse 40 of uh, chapter 25, he says here, See that you make them, that is the tabernacle, the, the tent, the, the curtains, the, all of it, after the pattern for them, which was shown to you on the mountain. And again, 26, looking at the 30th verse, you're going to read this, the, almost the same exact statement. Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan to which you have been shown in the mountain. God repeats himself. And God doesn't repeat himself just to repeat himself. It's to underscore emphasis, to underscore the importance of this. Don't deviate from my plan. I gave it to you for a reason. So again, go, applying this today, when we read something about Scripture about why the church is supposed to do something else like this, or why is baptism required, or, or why we partake the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, every week, it's because God gave us explicit instructions. And who are we to question the Almighty? And oftentimes he gives us the reason. But again, if we truly believe this is the word of God, we need to act like it. And so he gives those instructions. He built it explicitly. But some were left questioning. And as some do, do today, uh, this is some of the issues that are going on in, in some of the our Lord, church's Lord's people. Is, well, isn't there, isn't there a little room for deviation? Can't we add just a little bit? What's so wrong about that? Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, and if you've been a Christian long enough, I, you probably can quote this from memory. But it's because it's a powerful example and why it gets brought up so often. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. I'm going to pause there. We're going to read verses 2 and 3. Sons of Aaron, they had the responsibility to be priests of the people, to teach the people accurately the things concerning righteousness and living and what God wanted in worship. The responsibility on, it fell on them. God gave explicit instructions of where they were to get the fire and when they were going to offer it and where they were going to offer it. And in the text says they offered strange fire, which the Lord had not authorized. The New International Version kind of just repeats itself, but I think it's done uh, with an intent behind it. It reads that they offered unauthorized fire, which the Lord had not authorized. So you don't miss the point of what's going on here. So we don't miss the point of what's going on here. They were adding to the pattern. Verse 2. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. And this may seem very harsh to us, but consider again that these were priests. They were literate. It was their job to read and understand the law. They were the ones in a position to know exactly what God wanted. And it's not like God hid it in some sort of code that you got to decipher using a special ring to figure out what God wanted. He was explicitly blunt with these people. 
And he does it for their benefit, for our benefit today, so we don't mess it up. But the funny thing is, we keep messing it up. They kept messing it up. And so because they, was, they were in a position to know, they, it was their responsibility. They knew better. That's why I think the punishment met was so severe there, because they were in a position to know and they chose not to. They knew what the law said, and they offered unauthorized fire before God. They added to the pattern. A little deviation. It's like what Christ said, a little leaven can leaven the whole loaf. So a little deviation is, can corrupt the whole, whole pattern that God has given us. But then the question comes up, well, what if it's a good thing? What if it seems it's the right thing to do? In 2 Samuel chapter 6, here we have another example of they're doing a good thing. They're, they're bringing the ark back to where it should be. They're moving the ark. You know, they've lost it. They, they have been sent in this man's house, so they come and they're going to move it back to Jerusalem. They can put it in the temple and they can actually put it where it's supposed to be and they can worship and do everything that God wants them to. I don't think any of us here would, would disagree. That's a good thing. The ark should be where it should be, where it's meant to be. But then we read here, verses 1 through 7. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him at Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the, by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned above the cherubim. And they placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of uh, Abinadab, which is on a hill. And Uzzah and Iho, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they brought, it, uh, they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Iho was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of entrance made of fir wood with lyres and harps and tambourines and cats and hats and cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord struck against Uzzah, and the God struck him down there for his irreverence, and they died before the ark of God. You can read on later. Um, but that was not what God required to move the ark. God specified in Leviticus. And we'll see later, we can see later here in this account as well. The ark of God was to be carried by the Levites, by the poles that were supposed to be inserted inside the ark, and that's what God specified. And so even though this was a situation where it's, we could, we, I don't think any of us are going to disagree, it's a good thing. The ark needs to go where it needs to belong but they deviated from the pattern. And it's often been said that Uzzah's main mistake perhaps was assuming that his hands were any more clean than the ground that the, the ark would have fallen on. And again, Uzzah was perhaps doing a good thing. He thought the ark was going to fall down and he tries to catch it, but they deviated from the pattern. And again, he was in a position. David was in a position to know. The Levites were in a position to know, and they failed their responsibility as the people who were supposed to instruct God to follow his pattern. So as we kind of close here, I want to emphasize God's way is always the right way. You cannot go wrong by following God's pattern. The Lord taught a lot about worship. And John chapter 4, Here we have recorded an account with Jesus and a woman of Samaria. And they get talking about worship. Now see, the Samaritans, uh, real quickly, they, they came about during the first captivity. Assyria had gone in and captured the northern part of Israel and, and basically forced deported most of the Israelites. Some were still left. Then the Assyrians brought in their own people. And they intermarried, and they, and they became basically a, a new race, according to the Jews. They weren't fully Gentile, but they weren't fully Jewish. They were the Samaritans. And they had just basically a, 
a, a knockoff version of Judaism. They had their own temple. They tried following the law, but in their own places. So here we have somebody who they claim to be following God's pattern, but their deviations are all over the place. And what spawns this conversation, she has a question. What mountain is the correct mountain? Because they had their mount where their temple was at, and then there was Mount Jerusalem where the temple of Solomon was at. And he says, you're starting in verse 21, he says, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Really, the simple application here is the spirit here is the right attitude. Not going through a rote habit or just filling a pew every week, but worshiping God because it is the only logical thing to do. It's an outpouring, it's the expression of love and devotion to him for everything he's done for us. And then the in truth part is, well, it's according to God's pattern. What has God revealed about what he desires for worship? And so it, it, it's coupled. If we're going to have the right attitude in worship, we're going to want to follow what God has given us because he does, doesn't give us stuff in his scripture for busy work. There's a purpose. God's way is always the right way, and so we need to understand that in our worship we are, trying, we are seeking to please God and not man. So the assembly is not for entertainment. Now, that does not mean, and applying this does not mean I, I have the right or I will ever get up here and lecture to you in a very monotone vo voice like in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Bueller, Bueller. I just, I've sat through that. I've fallen asleep in that. I get it. The Word of God should be engaging. Worship should be engaging, but we should not confuse engagement for entertainment. But Paul, what does Paul say here in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10? He says here to the Galatians, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. When it comes to the worship, it's not about my preferences. It's about what God would have us to do. Because I tell you what, right now, I think orchestras are great. Some of the arrangements out there are fantastic. I sang in choir for years that the, the way they can do things is amazing to me. I may even like a rock band, but my preferences do not give me a right to impose that on worship. My preferences never give me a right to add or take away from the Word of God. Because when I start imposing my preferences, who am I the one I'm trying to please? I'm trying to please myself. Worship then becomes about me and what I like instead of what God has required. And we must have the heart right in worship. And that goes back to the spirit part because turn to the prophet uh, Amos. It's unfortunate that so many of the minor prophets had to deal with this problem of vain worship, of dead worship, of people just going through the motions. It got to such a point that God spoke through the prophet Amos here in chapter 5, starting in verse 21. He says, I hate and I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not only look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. It got to a point where their whole attitude was they're just going through the motions. They're just offering up. They're just doing what the law says. It was devoid of any devotion towards God. And so God just says here, I want none of it. Stop it. He says in another prophet, he says, I wish you would just close the temple door and stop offering sacrifices. I'm done with you because it's dead. 
So again, we have to have that right heart, the right motivation, that spirit part, that, that outpouring of devotion to God. And through that outpouring, the following of what he requires for us in his pattern. So what was the purpose of, New Te- of worship in New Testament times? After all, if we're trying to be the New Testament church, we're trying to follow the things that God has revealed in his Bible and do them as he wants us to do them, what is the purpose then of worship? First of all, I, we, we've touched on some of this, it's to honor God. Uh, going back to the book of, uh, going to Ephesians, rather, in chapter 3, Starting in verse 20. It says here, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So when we assemble together, that's, that's the, one of the purposes, or what, that's what our assembly should be doing, is giving glory and honor to God through offering acceptable worship to him, what he would have us, what he requires, what he desires. And so my worship then ought to focus on bringing glory to God. Secondly, it's to remember the Lord's death. And we're not going to read all these scriptures. I've put the ones up in brackets to remind myself of places I want to go. But in Luke, the 22nd chapter, and I have to thank Carlos uh, for the talk he gave on the table because he touched on much of what I wanted to. Um, And so I hope you were listening to that. Uh, In Luke chapter 22, we see Christ's instructions of giving on instituting the Lord's Supper and why he is doing so. So starting there in verse 19, he said, When he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood, in my blood. And so he's telling us, he's giving us instructions to remember him, remember that sacrifice. That's, That's the key characteristic in the early church was they came together weekly to observe the Lord's Supper. In fact, majority of the book of Corinthians is correcting the abuses that they made to the Lord's Supper. That's why he gives the instructions again in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. He gives the instructions and he talks about how we must judge ourselves rightly, examining ourselves while we're partaking of the Lord's Supper. Be mindful of what it represents. Again, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, I, I bring that up just to show that it was a pattern of the early church, that that was the purpose of their assemblies. Luke writes there in Acts 20, verse 7, that upon the first day of the week when we gathered to break bread, and Paul prolonged his message to midnight, outlines there the worship of what they did in the early church. The Lord's table was paramount. To remember that death, because it's only by that death that we have the hope of eternal life, and it's only by that death do we get to be healed spiritually. And so, it's incredibly important. And finally, the, the, the purpose of the assemblies in Washington New Testament were to, to comfort, to edify, and to instruct. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, looking at the 26th verse here, In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, Paul writes to these Christians here, he says, What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, each has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification, or the enrichment, or the improving, the building up of each other. And in Colossians chapter 3, another uh, parallel verse here, Colossians 3 and verse 16, Speaking specifically to our singing and, and why the church sings, uh, unaccompanied or unhindered by instruments, at least mechanical instruments, we see here, he says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, 
with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. He speci God specified the instrument we use in our worship. We sing and make melody in our hearts. The heart is an instrument. And that is, that's towards the building up of each other. We, we've talked some of what singing does and why, perhaps some of the wisdom behind why God chose singing. When a group sings together, actually a psychological bond begins to form between the people singing. Uh, oftentimes in, in uh, professional singing groups, choirs, and even a local congregation, breaths and heartbeats do sync up. So in, in moments in the public singing, we are literally breathing and beating as one person to emphasize that unity that Christ desires of his followers. But the assemblies, the worship was patterned after what God revealed, what God desired. And so I hope we would resolve to pattern our lives after what God has revealed in his word. And the other thing that the church did and continues to do today, and again, not that this building or the institution, but the people, that's what church means. The other thing that they did was they proclaimed the gospel publicly and from house to house. If you are here this morning and you have not yet named the name of Christ, if you are still resisting him and you know what you need to do, you know why he died for you, you know exactly what must you do, to you, I would ask you, why do you delay? But for those of you here this morning who perhaps are asking, well, what is it that I have to do to be saved? Turn me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 outlines very plainly what man must do in order to be saved, to be brought in a right relationship to Christ. And that, that the simple answer is you have to die to sin and begin to live to God. And that only takes place when we submit ourselves to baptism. Not that the water cleanses us, all the power is in God in baptism, but it is what God has required us to do in order to be made in the right relationship with him. Look here in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 3. He says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. And Jesus himself said in Mark 16, 16, that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But I want to emphasize very clearly, you can be baptized all day long, but if you do not remain faithful unto death, it will be all for naught. So if you're ready to name the name of Christ this morning, to be united with him in the waters of baptism, to die to sin and begin to live the God, we would love to help you with that. If you've done that in the past and you're struggling or you have sin that needs confessing, I would encourage you to resolve that before it's eternally too late. So please come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation.